the working women of Australia in this crisis. It being 2 p.m., we'll move to questions without notice, and I would like some guidance as to who has the first question. <laughs> Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Women, <laughs> Senator Payne. Minister Sukkar justified providing stimulus for jobs in the male-dominated housing industry while providing none for jobs in female-dominated industries by saying, yes, it is dominated by men and in many cases those people will be supporting families. Does the minister endorse his comments? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Very much, Mr. President. I actually didn't hear all of uh, Senator Pratt's question, uh, and uh, the observation I would make in, in relation to uh, the part that I did hear. Sorry, Senator. Order. Point of order. Sorry. No, no. I'm not actually complaining. I'm actually suggesting could we restart the clock and we'll have the question I, again because the, the minister leave, should hear the question before with she the leave of the Senate. Sorry, I'll, thank I'm, you. I'm happy to let the question be asked again, Senator Pratt. Thank you. Um, to, Minister to Senator Payne, Minister Sukkar justified providing stimulus for jobs in the male-dominated housing industry whilst providing none for female-dominated industries by saying, yes, it is dominated Order, Henderson. Yes, it is dominated by men and in many cases those people will be supporting families. Does the minister endorse his comments? Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, I am glad that uh, Senator Pratt put that question again. As I understand it, Minister Sukar is the Minister for Housing, uh, and so therefore I would expect him to talk about the housing industry and the construction industry as it relates to his Order. portfolio. As it absolutely relates to his portfolio, and so I didn't hear his uh, direct comments. Uh, but if, if Minister Sukar is speaking about his portfolio, then obviously that's what I would expect him to do. But I do want to refer you to another speech, Mr President, which will be remarkably inconvenient for those officers. But nevertheless, the Prime Minister in his CEDAR speech, for example, earlier this week, has been absolutely clear in saying that we know there is a disproportionate impact on women and goes on to speak also about younger Australians uh, and those with lower skills and a range of other people with challenges in the workforce which identify key parts of the labour force key parts of the Australian community we need to focus on as we prepare and plan our way out and make our way out. We need to focus on. That is the words order. of the Prime Minister order. of Australia, Mr President, so in Senator, relation to order. these issues. Senator Corman on a point of order? Uh, a is it the of obvious order. one about noise, Senator Corman? Po po point of order. Uh, interjections are disorderly. The most persistent interjector always is the Leader of the Opposition, and I would ask her to call it to order. order. Senator, I was calling the chamber to order. Minister is correct. Interjections are always disorderly. Senator Payne to continue. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The Prime Minister went on in his CETA speech to make a number of other points, including the uh, work that JobKeeper and JobSeeker has done to put a fall, a floor, I'm sorry, uh, under the fall in consumer confidence, uh, which we saw in March, uh, and we have now recovered. Order. We have now recovered uh, that lost ground in consumer confidence, and both the Westpac and the ANZ indices tell us that. The high-frequency spending data shows that that's been increasingly translated into increased retail sales. Those opposite mention uh, work areas which have a high proportion of women working in them. That includes hospitality and retail. And we know that the good news for those women and for young people who work in both of those areas, for example, that they will be Order. early benefited from time the reopening the answer process. Has expired. And Senator Payne, time for the answer has expired. Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. Thank you. Yesterday, the ABS released data which showed that since March, women lost payroll jobs at 1.3 times the rate of men. Modelling from the Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre found that the majority of the casuals excluded from JobKeeper are women, including more than 200,000 women in retail and fast food alone. Why did the government design a scheme that leaves women behind during Australia's first recession in 29 Order. years? Senator Payne. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. I absolutely reject the premise of Senator Pratt's question. I absolutely reject the premise of Senator order. Pratt's Senator question. Wong, and in order. fact, Senator Payne, I have um, Senator Cormann on a point of order. Uh, uh, Senator Wong doesn't even try to um, uh, comply with standing orders. So interjections are disorderly. Please call it to order. I was, I was doing so at that point, and I'm going to reinstate my request that senators who are called to order at least count to ten before they commence breaching standing orders again. Um, Senator Payne to continue. Thank you very much, Mr President. As I said, I absolutely reject the premise of Senator Pratt's question. And what has been made clear by ministers, what has been made clear by the Treasurer, what has been made clear by the Finance Minister, by the Prime Minister uh, and by me, is that we absolutely recognise it is critical that in the recovery process we draw on the Order, capabilities of the entire nation. Men, women, women, men, to ensure the fastest possible economic and social recovery. Senator Pratt, a final supplementary question. Yesterday, Minister Lay said in the other place, women have been hardest hit through COVID-19. So why, in the last two weeks alone, has the government left women further behind by snapping back to unaffordable childcare, dudding aged care workers, taking from childcare workers and refusing paid parental leave from people who are expecting to be eligible. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It seems to me that those opposite would prefer to have seen the childcare sector collapse upon itself. It seems to me that they would have preferred that a government didn't take advice from a sector about how best to sustain it in the middle of a pandemic. Order. Because, quite frankly, you don't even have the basic skills. Order. Order. I will call the minister to continue when there's silence. I didn't. Order. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Prior to COVID-19. Order. Senator Cormann on Senator a point Wong of order. Senator continues to defy your order. Uh, interjections are disorderly. No. Senator Wong on a point uh, of he's order. He's very sensitive today. I actually said across the table for him that you know he, if he was going to play this game, we would in, we would make the point that he was interjecting order. on his own minister. I, I I'm not sure that that's order, an interjection. Senator it's a Wong. private conversation with the leader um, of the government. I'm not going to. I don't want to get to the point where um, what I might broadly describe as conversation across the centre table I deem as interjections. However, there have been interjections, Senator Wong, and I have called you to order previously. Um, Senator Payne, to continue. Thank you very much, Mr President. I'll do my best. Prior to COVID-19, there were more women in the workforce in Australia than ever before. The gender pay gap had closed to its lowest level on record at 13.9 per cent. When Labor was last in office, it was 17.4 per cent, Mr President. And our ambition as a government is to return to those numbers and grow them and enhance them. Order. That is the approach that we will be taking. We absolutely know that we must draw upon every woman and every man in this country in the recovery process to ensure the fastest possible economic and Order. social recovery. Senator Payne. Senate, Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister update the Senate on the progress towards the exciting prospect of a free trade agreement with the United Kingdom? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Abetz for his question and his interest in, uh, in this very important topic because I'm pleased to inform the Senate that later today Australia and the United Kingdom will officially commence negotiations towards a free trade agreement between our two countries. This is a great step forward in terms of creating new opportunity that will lead to new and further job opportunities for Australians. The UK is already our seventh largest trading partner, and our total two-way trade is worth more than $30 billion a year. But we can do, we can do much more than that. We are seeking an ambitious and comprehensive free trade agreement which secures commercially meaningful market access for our farmers, for our businesses, across services sectors as well as goods, uh, and further strengthens our two-way investment flows. The UK is Australia's third largest services trading partner. In 2019, our two-way services trade was worth in excess of $15 billion. And we want to make sure that across financial services, professional services, telecommunications, fintech and emerging sectors, we enhance and strengthen those opportunities. The UK is already our second largest source of foreign investment in Australia, with foreign direct investment 
valued at some $127 billion in 2019. And we see exciting investments, such as by British-based pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca in their $200 million manufacturing facility in North Ryde in Sydney. But we do know that when the UK entered the European Economic Community uh, back in 1973, our agricultural exports suffered the worst. We were, at that stage, uh, the UK was our third largest goods trading partner. It's now only our 12th. And tariffs on agricultural products account for 67 per cent of all tariffs that the UK applies to Australian exports. We seek to eliminate as many of these as possible to create new opportunities for our farmers and our businesses to grow more Order. jobs through this Senator relationship. Birmingham. Senator Abet, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that very informative answer and ask, can the minister inform the Senate how a United Kingdom free trade agreement will create more jobs for Australians? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, one in five Australian jobs is dependent upon trade-related employment. Whether it's across Senator Abetz's home state of Tasmania, mine of South Australia or any other part uh, of our great country, there are so many Australians who rely upon trade and market access to sustain their employment and their jobs. It's estimated that through uh, our trade growth over recent years, more than 240,000 trade-related jobs have been created across Australia. And despite the challenges of the pandemic, we have seen trade volumes hold up very strongly into so many of our key markets. We know that there are more Australian businesses exporting, and we know from analysis that Australian household income is higher as a result of those trading relationships. This is all about making sure that we continue to post the record trade surpluses that we have off the back of record exports, and in doing so, we create even more job opportunities for people right across Australia. Senator Abetz, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate of how expanding the export market choices for our Australian farmers and businesses will assist our post-pandemic recovery? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, right through our time in government, we have sought to grow the choices for Australian farmers and businesses about who they do business with. That's why we've struck trade deals with the Republic of Korea, Japan, China, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and our Indonesia agreement that comes into force on 5 July. It's why, whilst we are pleased to be launching negotiations with the United Kingdom, we are also determined to conclude negotiations with the European Union, such a significant and valuable partner for us, and we look to make sure that we grow those opportunities across all of those EU nations and its population and potential consumer base for Australia of more than 400 million people. We've just completed and held our seventh round of negotiations with the EU, doing so through virtual negotiations and formats, but making sure we continue to make real progress to deliver the type of comprehensive trade agreement there that, again, can create more job opportunities for Australians and mutually beneficial outcomes for our nations. Senator Billick. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. A survey by Early Childhood Advocates, The Front Project, has found that the government's decision to make Australian families pay unaffordable childcare fees will take food from families' tables. More than half of parents said the high cost of early learning impacts their weekly grocery budget and how much they can buy. Why is the government making parents choose between food and care during Australia's first recession in 29 years? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I have not been made aware of the survey. I'm not familiar with the group that, uh, that Senator Billick referred to. But, Mr. President, I think it's very important to be clear here uh, about the response that the government has uh, has worked through, which is something that's never been done before, because Australian families were indeed facing a crisis that is unprecedented. We took an important and temporary measure to help Australian families get through the crisis. We are supporting the childcare sector to keep it strong and to keep its workers employed, both of which are fundamental to any provision of any childcare at all. We also know, as those opposite have raised, that we have seen women do an even more disproportionate share of unpaid caring and domestic work, and that's an issue that we believe needs to be addressed, irrespective of COVID-19. We know that working or returning to work needs access to childcare. 
What many service providers and sector peak bodies have told the government is that that rising demand could not be supported on what were the then business continuity payments that formed the basis of the emergency relief package. Parents were also reporting, and I have said this in the chamber before in response to other questions, that they couldn't access the level of care that they needed into the future under the relief package as it stood. But we don't believe and we don't agree with those opposite on a number of the points that they have made. Parents who are able to afford to pay for childcare, of course, will continue to be expected to do that. That is how the system works. But there are always those who, as Senator Billick has pointed out, who face further challenges. Those who cannot afford it Order. because of Senator Payne. Senator Billick, a supplementary question. Thank you. One Western Australian mother told the West Australian newspaper, My out of pocket expense is three quarters of my salary. When bills come in, I ha often have to work out how I can feed my family or pay the rates. Why is the government bringing back fees when costs went up 7.2 per cent in the last 12 months alone? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As a government, we have put a considerable greater contribution into the childcare system in this country. Importantly, in the context of this process, we have also established uh, a transition payment. Uh, is, is, as it is described, that was the choice between having an ongoing JobKeeper or a 25 per cent subsistence payment to the sector. We are talking about the same amount of support in that context, but it does mean that more employees are able to be helped. And in the consultations that government had with the sector, that was seen as the better way forward. So that transition payment of 25 per cent of childcare services fees revenue will continue to support the sector through to the 27th of September. In fact, it puts $708 million back into the sector as it moves back to the childcare subsidy system. What we have said Senator to providers is that in order to receive the transition payment, providers will need to guarantee employment levels order. to protect Senator staff Payne. as they move Time off job the has expired. Senator Billick, final supplementary question. Mr Morrison's childcare snapback will hurt family budgets. Mr Morrison's JobKeeper snapback will cost families their jobs. Mr Morrison's JobSeeker snapback will see them have a fraction of the support they need. Why is this government determined to hurt Australian families in September? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me repeat that we have put $708 million into the sector as it moves back to the child care subsidy system, and that is an important contribution from the Commonwealth, recognising a number of the challenges that continue in the sector. And I want to be very clear in terms of condi continued additional support for families who need it. We are providing a safety net in the form of an additional childcare subsidy for families in financial difficulty. Those families can still receive free care for a maximum of up to 100 hours per fortnight. The additional childcare subsidy for families transitioning from job seeker back to work, easing the activity test until 4 October to help families whose employment has been affected. They will receive subsidised care as they return to work and study and training. So to ensure the viability of the, of the sector, to ensure that childcare Order, can actually Senator be accessed, Payne, this is a very important process. Senator Seward. President, Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, through you, uh, President, to the Minister. Is the government still intending to drop people on the job seeker payment back to the base rate of $40 a day at the end of September? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Mm. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Senator Seward. Um, as I have um, mentioned in this chamber on a number of occasions in the last few weeks, um, the coronavirus supplement that was made available to people who were on working age payments uh, at the start of the, uh, the coronavirus um, pandemic um, was put in place for the period of the pandemic. Uh, we made it very clear at the time that the, all of the measures that we put in place, not just the coronavirus supplement, but all of the measures that we put in place, were time limited, 
they were timely and they were to be targeted to make sure that we were able to help as many Australians as we possibly could get from where they were at the time with, this, uh, with the pandemic and the implications of the pandemic on the economy and on their employment prospects to get them from there to the other side of the pandemic. Uh, we are absolutely committed to make sure that we continue to support Australians so that we can, uh, we can manage so that they can manage their lives during this pandemic. But as we've seen over recent days, we're now starting to see the economy opening up again. We're seeing restrictions able to be lifted. We're seeing jobs being created again in the marketplace. In fact, um, today we were, were pleased to report that we're starting to see the earliest of green shoots with increased job creation above the levels of job creation that we'd actually anticipated. Uh, and so today um, we are working our way through making sure that we can put in place all of the things that we need to do so that the economy can open up. And so those people that you refer to that are currently uh, receiving payments through income support are able to get back into the workforce so that they can make provisions uh, so that they can improve their wellbeing. So, uh, Senator Seawood, the, uh, the coronavirus supplement was time limited, it was temporary and it was targeted. Senator C, what a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll take that as a yes, you do intend to drop it back to $40 a day. Has the government done any modelling on the expected rate of mortgage defaults and the number of renters who will be in housing stress in October if the rate does go back to $40 a day? If not, why not? If so, what are the details, please? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And, and as the senator rightly points out, this has actually been one of the most unprecedented situations that any government in the world has ever had to confront. In fact, I'm sure that there hasn't been a government in the world that's had to confront this probably uh, since the Second World War. Um, and so, obviously, as we work our way forward to deal with all of the challenges that are before us, um, as we get our economy back on track and get it onto a stable footing, we'll be looking at many things. Um, and we will continue to monitor as we see the impacts of this crisis um, become further um, um, aware. And so we will continue to work with the sectors, all of the sectors around Australia. The Prime Minister continues to work with his state and territory counterparts through the, the continuation of the National Cabinet to make sure that we're in the best possible position on the other side of the coronavirus um, pandemic to make sure that we can continue to support all Australians in their lives. Senator C, would it find I'll take that question? one as a no. Minister, if the job seeker payment goes back to $40 a day at the end of, October, at in, at the end of September, what essential bills such as housing, power, water, food does the government suggest people don't pay? Good. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator C, for your follow-up question. Um, Clearly, you haven't been listening to what the, uh, we've been saying in this place, what Senator Cormann said in response to many of the questions that he's been asked this week. The most important thing that we can do is to get the economy back open again so we can get people back into work. The other thing that Senator Seawitt, that you failed to recognise in your original question when you refer to the $40 a day is the myriad of other supports and payments that are particularly targeted to people. Uh, for instance, um, anybody who has got children obviously is eligible to receive uh, the full amount of the family tax benefit, Part A and Part B. Those people who are in rental accommodation that you refer to are obviously eligible to be in receipt of uh, the Commonwealth rental assistance. And there are a myriad of other payments that are made available to make sure that our welfare system targets the specific needs of individuals who require the support Cameras. of the federal government. He doesn't have a question. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. How is the Liberal National Government expanding trade and gaining better access to markets? Sen Senator, Patrick, <laughs> Senator Patrick, props aren't allowed. Remove that immediately. You, quite frankly, you're embarrassing yourself and you're demeaning Australian politics and the people who, elect for, who vote for you. Remove that or I'll remove you from the chamber immediately. Re remove yourself from the chamber, Senator Patrick. Senator Macdonald, I'll ask you to start your question again. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. My, 
How is the Liberal National Government expanding trade and gaining better access to markets with our major trading partners for the agricultural sector? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And can I thank uh, Senator Macdonald for her question and can I also recognise her strong interest and commitment to the regional communities of Australia and our agricultural and primary industry sectors. Um, Senator Macdonald has a very strong understanding of the importance of overseas markets to uh, rural and regional communities and the businesses that exist within them. Um, it is quite an astonishing statistic, Mr. President, that 70 per cent of agricultural production, of Australia's agricultural production, is exported. So therefore, access to a diverse range of overseas markets is very important to Australia and never more important than it is now uh, with the economic challenges that Australia faces uh, with uh, the coronavirus pandemic. This government uh, has a very strong record, Mr President, in delivering market access and opportunities uh, to all of our um, Australian industries, but particularly to our farmers and fishers. And, um, today, I'm very pleased to be in the Senate with my colleague, uh, the Minister for Trade, Minister Birmingham, on the cusp of uh, embarking on a new free trade agreement negotiations with the United Kingdom. Um, in the UK uh, and in the EU, where negotiations are already underway, there is enormous opportunity to deliver ambitious and comprehensive free trade agreements, securing more favourable access for Australian products into these new markets. The government understands that it's not just about new markets for our agricultural sector, but we also need to make sure that our industries know exactly how they can best make advantage of these new, new markets. We don't take a set and forget approach. So through a series of 12 uh, webinars, Austrade will ensure that exporters have all of the information that they need uh, so that they can take the most advantage on the steps that they need to take to take advantage of their free trade agreements. Um, and Australia's free trade agreements with free trading partners continue to deliver huge Order, benefits Senator for Rustin. Australia. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. How will the government's prioritisation of new and better free trade agreements benefit farmers and our rural, regional and remote communities, as well as the broader Australian economy? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you again to the Senator for her question, because exports are absolutely vital to the Australia's agricultural industries and our regional economies, with more than two-thirds of our production exported. So growth in Australian exports to premium markets is absolutely vital for the future of our agricultural sector, and maintaining strong relationships with our trading partners is absolutely critical to that success. Australian businesses that export, um, you'll be interested to know, on average hire 23 per cent more staff. Um, they pay 11 per cent higher wages and they have labour productivity 13 per cent higher than non-exporters. These are industries that are leading Australia. And so trade is a very major contributor to our economy. It's a major creator of jobs and it has a positive impact on our ability to be able to play for the essential services that all Australians rely on. It is absolutely essential that we get these free trade agreements in place. Thanks. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. What other measures has the government implemented to assist Australian agriculture to thrive? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, we have a, a range of programs that we've put in place to help um, Australian agriculture. I mean, just last week um, we implemented uh, the new Farm Household Alliance program to make sure that we can assist our farmers that, uh, to put food on the table and to help them through what has been a very crippling drought in our agricultural areas. We have also invested in rural financial counselling services so that farmers can get the advice, what the advice they need when they need it, to make sure that they can make the best possible decisions uh, to ensure their longevity and to make sure that they are able to get into the export markets that Senator Birmingham is about to open up for them. Uh, it's also very important to note that we take the mental health and well-being um, of our farmers very, very seriously um, and make sure that we have got the funds and the resources behind that. But there are a myriad of other things that the government's doing. Concessional loans, taxation measures that are general, uh, water for fodder and silage and pasta, uh, path, pasture. Um, the Australian government is committed to Order, our farmers. Senator Rustin. <laughs> Senator Brown. Uh, thank you. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Last fortnight it was revealed that just 38 food boxes had been delivered under a program that was intended to provide 36 
1,000 food boxes to older Australians. Who is responsible for this failure and why did it go so wrong? Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, can I, at the outset, reject completely the premise of the question from uh, Senator Brown? Mr President, uh, this government, I think, quite wisely, quite wisely made provision to support senior Australians in the case that they, when, when there were issues at the supermarkets, when there were issues with senior Australians being able to get out, to be able to access support uh, that they might require. And so we put in place a measure, uh, in fact a range of measures that supported senior Australians to uh, be able to get the services that they required. In fact, Mr President, I'm pleased that not so many people needed to have uh, emergency food supplies provided to them. But I do know, but I do know, Mr. President, that a number of the other measures that we put in Order. place to, to assist senior Australians to provide food and provide meals were extremely successful. So, Mr. President, for example, for example, the the number of people receiving meals on wheels in some areas increased by 50 per cent. Another of the elements that we put in place to assist senior Australians that were in, are having problems providing food. So, Mr President, uh, we made provision Order. for what we estimated might be required by senior Australians uh, under that particular program. And, as, and Mr President, senior Australians were freely available to, uh, able to apply for the food boxes. Uh, it was a demand-driven process. And the fact that we have not needed to set out that many boxes, I think, is a success of many of the other measures that we have put in place, including the extraordinarily uh, additional uh, support that has been provided to senior Australians through programs like Meals on Wheels, uh, who have, as I said in some places, had up to a 50 per cent increase in demand and service provision. Senator Brown, order. On my left, Senator Brown is on her feet. On my uh, thank, right now, Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. My first supplementary question is: When did the minister first learn that the program would deliver 0.1 per cent of the food boxes promised to older Australians? Does the minister believe that the program has been a success? And if not, what less lessons has he learned? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, I don't believe that making provision for something that we think might be having, happening or might happen during a pandemic is a failure. In fact, I think the fact that not so many people required that service uh, is a good thing. It is a good thing. So, Mr President, just because the provision or the estimate that we made of what the demand might be hasn't been met is a clear demonstration of the fact that the number of other services that we put in place Senator to Brown. support senior on Australians order, have Senator Brown. Uh, um, on relevance. I've asked a number of uh, questions and I would ask you to for the min ask the minister to respond to the questions that have been asked. Senator Cormann on the point of order. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, the minister was being directly relevant. Some of the interjections were not being directly relevant. I mean, the minister made very clear that uh, people had the opportunity to apply for what is a demand-driven program. Uh, so on the, on the, I was about to... Points of order. I'm going to rule on the point of order. The minister is being directly relevant if he's talking about the program specifically about which he was asked. It is not appropriate for a point of order to simply ask me to instruct the minister to answer part or how to answer a question. The minister to continue. Order, Senator Watt. Mr. Mr. President, uh, I, I think it's it's a good thing that not that many people have required order. this form of assistance. But it is also a demonstration that the many other forms of assistance that we've provided to senior Australians Senator have clearly been a success. As Senator I said, Mr. President, in some places, up to a 50 per cent increase in the number of Meals on Wheels uh, demand uh, that have been provided through that service, and an extra 50 million Order, dollars Senator provided. Colbeck, time for the answer has expired. Senator Brown. Uh, thank Order. you, Mr. President. Why is this minister incapable of delivering older Australians anything more than empty slogans and unfulfilled promises? Order on my right. 
Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, I, I completely and utterly reject the premise of the question. We made provision for a service if people needed it. The fact is, Mr. President, that the demand hasn't been what uh, we suggested it, we thought it may have been. Mr. President, and it's a good thing that people have been able to get the food without having to rely on emergency relief Senator packages. Pratt. I think it's a good thing, Senator but it's Brown. also, as I've said, a demonstration of the fact that a range of measures that included additional capacity of over $50 million into Meals on Wheels has been a significant success, because Meals on Wheels provides a number of other things than just delivery of a uh, a, a food package might also deliver. It provides human contact. It provides a capacity to be in touch with the outside world. Mr. President, I am not at all disappointed at the fact that the demand hasn't been what we thought it may have been. And I don't regard it as a failure Order, to make Senator a promise. Colbeck. I've regarded it as a success. Time for the answer has expired. Please, Senator, please resume your seat. Order. Order. Senator Wong. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Senator, how will building an outward-looking, open and sovereign trading economy help to strengthen the Liberal and Nationals government record delivery for Australian small and family businesses and local job creation, particularly in regional New South Wales? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Davey uh, for the question. And uh, Senator Davey, like all of us in the Morrison government, understands it is critical to put in place policies to support small and family businesses in Australia. Uh, why? Because, in particular, when it comes to rural and regional Australia, they well and truly are the backbone of those communities. They give back to those communities. They support local jobs. They support local charities, and of course. Of course, they support the local sporting organisations. Mr President, this support has only been made even more important because of the impacts of COVID-19, but also because of the impacts of the bushfires uh, and because of the impacts of the drought on our economy. The government has a strong record of supporting small and family businesses across Australia, including, of course, fast-tracking tax relief for small and medium businesses, because we understand that the money that we give back to them, which was their own money, they're able to invest back into their business uh, and grow that business and create more jobs. We've also, as you know, improved access to finance uh, for those businesses so that they can access the money that they need, again, to grow their business and to create more jobs. We're also ensuring that small businesses are paid on time through our own government policies, leading by example, of course, but also in the implementation of the Payment Times reporting framework. On this side of the chamber, the government side of the chamber, we're absolutely committed to cutting red tape, obviously, and supporting small businesses with advice and disputes with the ATO and big business. Um, and of course, in the wake of COVID-19, we have put in place targeted measures to support small businesses. Uh, Mr President, the government's funding boost today of the Export Market Development Grant acknowledges, of course, the importance of ensuring that small businesses have the opportunity uh, to develop their ability to get into export markets. Thank you. Senator Davey, supplementary question. Thank you. And can you explain how the government's skills agenda now bolstered by the JobMaker Plan, is assisting the creation of local training opportunities and skilled employees in regional and rural New South Wales. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And the, uh, the government is supporting apprentices in Australia and uh, creating local training opportunities, in particular in regional Australia. Um, Senator Davey might remember the implementation of the Australian Apprentice Wage Subsidy, a very successful measure which of course provides wage subsidies for apprentices in areas of skill shortage, in particular in rural and regional Australia. Um, that wage subsidy was actually opposed uh, by those on the Labor side of politics. Uh, quite bizarre, actually. One would have thought they would have supported a measure, uh, in particular that was targeted at creating opportunities for small and family businesses to take on apprentices, in particular in areas of need and in rural and regional Australia. But at the time, it was uh, famously called uh, by those on the Labor side of the chamber a political fiasco. Uh, well, no, it 
wasn't a political fiasco. It was a policy that was implemented specifically to support businesses in rural and regional Australia. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. And why is supporting small and family businesses and their apprentices critical to supporting local economies, local jobs and local economic recovery following COVID-19? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. And again, uh, the Morrison government understands you need to support small and family businesses across Australia because they are the backbone of the Australian economy. It is critical that we put in place policies that will support them through this crisis, will enable them to come out the other side, prosper, grow, and ultimately create more jobs for Australians. Mr. President, there's around 3.5 million small businesses in Australia. They give the dignity of work every day and they employ over six million Australians. And when you come from rural or regional Australia, uh, as so many in this side of the chamber do, you acutely understand that these businesses they are the backbone of that local economy. They are the ones that are out there supporting local jobs. They are the ones out there supporting the local charities. And of course they are the ones uh, that you'll often see supporting the local sporting organisations. Uh, it is incredibly important that we put in place the right policies as we are doing to support these businesses Order. so they can Senator prosper Cash. Grow and create more Senator jobs. Faruqi. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture. In 2018, Minister Littleproud said he was shocked and gutted by footage of thousands of suffering sheep being cooked alive aboard the live export ship Awasi Express. All of Australia was shocked and appalled by this unspeakable cruelty to animals, which has been going on for decades. While the government refuses to shut down live exports, they did implement a ban on live sheep exports to the Northern Hemisphere during summer months because of the excruciating suffering heat stress inflicts. Now you've made a mockery of your own rules by granting an exemption to Retwa ship scheduled to leave Fremantle today. Minister, why did the government bother instituting new rules for live exports if it had no intention of enforcing them? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Faruqi, for your question. Um, firstly, can I say that um, the Australian government takes the, uh, responsi our responsibility uh, for animal welfare, particularly in our farming sector, very, very seriously. Um, as you'd be aware, um, the decision uh, was made by the federal court to allow uh, the El Kuwait to uh, load and sail. Uh, and I'd also like to point out to you that um, there is an independent observer aboard that ship uh, and will sail with that voyage uh, to, all the way to its destination. Um, so the, uh, the matter that you are referring to um, is, is one that we take very seriously. There are in place uh, very, very strict rules and guidelines around uh, the export of, uh, of live animals from this country. Um, and you rightly pointed out, and I think everybody in Australia was absolutely disgusted at the footage that we saw um, last year, um, and that is why this government has worked absolutely tirelessly with the industry, with the sector, with people um, who have an interest in, in, um, in the welfare of animal, animals to make sure that our live export trade is done in a manner that's absolutely world's best practice. And in fact, um, Senator Faruqi, I, I think I would be correct in saying um, that as Australia's um, live export trade and our animal welfare conditions that we expect all of our farmers uh, to undertake is seen around the rest of the world as the best practice. And through our demonstration of best practice, we like to think that we are encouraging other countries around the world to undertake best practice as well and in doing so increase the levels of, uh, of animal welfare protections that are in place for all animals uh, that are around the world. Uh, but we will not destroy our Australian agricultural sector uh, by ideological pursuit when we have put in place very, very strict provisions. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, the Department of Agriculture obviously has a glaring conflict of interest as the so-called independent regulator of an industry it actively promotes. The Moss review showed that the Department of Agriculture had failed animals and was incapable of regulating the live export industry. Will the government commit to establishing an independent office of animal welfare at arm's length from the minister and the Department of Agriculture to protect animals from cruelty and exploitation? 
Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I first of all refute um, that there is a conflict um, of, of interest, and I would uh, absolutely um, endorse. The, uh, the processes that are in place now as a result of many reviews and, and much, uh, much change uh, since we saw that horrific footage uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and so I think that the Australian government, through the, independent, um, uh, um, uh, the independence of the Department of Agriculture's role uh, in being the inspector, uh, have put in place um, a set of conditions that uh, ensure that Australia's live exports are governed under the strictest, very strictest of conditions, and the fact that we were um, that we have the LQ8 has been able to load um, today is a reflection that the federal court viewed the provisions that have been put in place by the Department of Agriculture as being adequate to protect the welfare of those animals on board that ship. Yeah, yeah. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Minister, I have received thousands of emails in just the last two weeks from people across Australia who are angry at the way this government mistreats animals. Order, they want order an on my right. Order, so, order on my right. Stop the clock. Order on my right. I need to hear the question. Senator Fruki to continue. They want animal cruelty to end, but of course this government just does not care. Will the minister just be honest and admit once and for all that this government will prioritise profits for big business over animal welfare every single time? Senator Rustin. Uh, well, first of all, I would say absolutely the Australian government does not, does not uh, do as you have alleged. The Australian government is absolutely committed to upholding the absolutely very high standards of animal welfare while supporting a sustainable live export trade. Um, this is very important that we get the balance right. Um, animal welfare, absolute priority. Jobs for Australians, particularly rural and regional jobs for rural and regional Australia, and the economies and the regional communities that, that rely upon them. We saw the absolute disaster that was created when we banned, at a knee-jerk reaction, the live export from northern Australia and to watch those hundreds of thousands of cattle die of starvation because an industry got stopped in its tracks was probably far crueler than anything that you could ever imagine, Senator Faruqi. So maybe think about what you're saying, because right now we are absolutely committed to the highest level of animal welfare, and we will continue to be so whilst providing Order, Senator jobs. Rustin. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. In what has been described as a, and I quote, rare public speech, end quote, last night at the ANU, the Foreign Minister finally acknowledged the issue of foreign state-backed disinformation in Australia. Order. The risks of foreign state-backed disinformation have been known for many years, given, for example, the occurrences in Crimea in 2014, the US in 2016 and Hong Kong last year. Can the Minister explain why it has taken the government until now to finally act? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. I must, be having, I must be having hearing difficulties today, Mr President. It comes with age, I'm sure, but let me start at the beginning. I'd be very happy to send Senator Wong the collected works uh, so that she had ready access to a vast range uh, of remarks. And in fact, Senator, I'll have it drop down to the chamber for you any time. And in fact, I'll even table it if that would assist you with your consideration. Uh, I think what the Australian government uh, has, has clearly set out, has clearly set out, uh, and indeed what the Prime Minister talked about at the Lowy Institute, was prosecuting a case for our national interests, and that includes through multilateral institutions. As you know, the Prime Minister instituted the multilateral audit and asked my Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to carry out that audit. Part of that process has, has meant examining over a hundred multilateral institutions, processes and fora, and that has underpinned everything we have done. What the audit findings have shown us uh, is the value of focusing on our national interest and ensuring that in doing so we work within the appropriate systems to achieve outcomes for Australia in our national interest, which should always be the premise upon which Order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, direct relevance. The question is about foreign state-backed disinformation. And my question was why the government has taken until now to act, given the examples we've seen internationally. Um, I've allowed you to restate the question. I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. She has 47 seconds remaining. Senator Payne. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, and I was responding, I thought, directly to a number of the observations that Senator Wong made in her in her question. But specifically, if she wishes, in relation to the question of disinformation, what the government has made clear is the threat that disinformation, no matter who perpetrates it, uh, places or, or presents to the orderly provision of information in communities, particularly in the context of a pandemic. And the critical uh, impact that we have seen in a number of countries that has drawn together the European Union, that has drawn together 131 countries in a motion uh, drafted by, uh, by, by Latvia uh, on the infodemic, is absolutely symbolic of those concerns and of our Order. concerns Senator in relation Payne. to that impact. Senator Wong, supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters said in 2016 it was essential this issue of foreign state-backed disinformation be considered as part of Australian elections. So I again ask, after four years of thinking about it, beyond the headlines, what is the Morrison government now actually doing to protect Australian elections from foreign state-backed disinformation? Senator Payne. Mr. President, I would remind the Senator and those opposite of the passing of the uh, Countering Foreign Interference legislation, which is absolutely apposite uh, in this case, absolutely apposite to the sorts of issues that the Senator is raising. So, in the midst of the pandemic and in the midst of the crisis that we and millions and millions of people around the world have been dealing with. Order. We are absolutely focused on the importance of shining a light on disinformation because it is the most effective antidote. <laughs> Senator Wong, final supplementary question. Thank you. In last night's speech, the Foreign Minister also finally rebuked Mr Morrison's infamous negative globalism speech of last October. Given the internal opponents of multilateralism within the coalition include Minister Dutton, who says, and I quote, there are other bodies within the UN that aren't acting certainly in the interests of Australia. How will this minister persuade her colleagues that multilateralism is a key Australian national interest? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I absolutely and fundamentally reject the premise of Senator Wong's question. Absolutely and fundamentally. And as I was trying to say in my response to her first question, very, very clearly, when the Prime Minister talked at the Lowy Institute, he talked about prosecuting a case for our national interests, including through multilateral institutions. He instituted the multilateral audit. He asked the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to carry it out, and that audit has been absolutely comprehensive. And what it shows us is that Australia has a very important role to play in shaping the values and the norms within multilateral institutions themselves. And we're talking about institutions that are extremely important to Australia, Mr President, in terms of advancing our national interests, promoting and protecting our values, whether they are underpinning the global rules and norms that ensure a level playing field, whether they're regulating international cooperation in areas like aviation, in telecommunications, in maritime transport, Order. in intellectual Senator property, Payne, and a range time of for others. The answer has expired. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister outline how the Morrison government is building an outward-looking and globally competitive defence industry here in Australia? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Henderson, for the question and for your unrelenting support for Australian defence industry. Uh, look, the Morrison government is fully committed to delivering a globally competitive Australian defence industry a defence industry that delivers three sovereign outcomes for our nation. Firstly, to meet our contemporary defence needs. Secondly, to create thousands of multi-generational jobs right here in Australia. And thirdly, to achieve greater export success. We are providing an unprecedented opportunities for Australian industry to participate in defence work. We are very purposely and very deliberatively maximising opportunities for Australian industry involvement in defence programs. As our companies bid for work, they are now required to submit Australian industry capability plans detailing how they will maximise opportunities for Australian businesses. We absolutely hold these companies to account on their contracted commitments through enforceable deliverables. 
and we are now also developing an independent Australian capability audit program to validate delivery of this contracted commitment. At the heart of our industry policy is a commitment to support the global competitiveness of Australia's defence industry, as seen in our defence export strategy. And to that end, this government has committed $20 million per year to support Australia's defence industry achieve greater export success. We have established the Australian Defence Export Office and a grants program. We have appointed a defence ex export advocate. We have released the fourth and largest defence sales catalogue this year. And finally, we have also invested $1.3 billion to support Australian technical innovation in defence industry. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline how this government's defence industry policies are creating opportunities for Australian companies and workers, both here and overseas? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I certainly can, Senator Henderson. <laughs> The Morrison government's $200 billion investment in defence capability provides unprecedented opportunities for Australian companies. And let me tell everybody in this chamber they are embracing these opportunities in record numbers. Thanks to the policies of those on this side of the chamber, global defence companies are establishing uniquely Australian entities uh, that are today employing thousands and thousands of Australians and are exporting Australian-built cutting-edge capability to the world. I'm so proud of companies like Talis Australia, of French origin, is now employing almost 4,000 Australians. And they are now delivering uh, for Australia and also now exporting high-technology products for defence, including the Bendigo-built Bushmasters. Another wonderful example are the 50 Australian companies, such as Kemmering Australia, just outside of Geelong, who are now exporting Order. over $1.7 billion the of export. Has expired. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline how these policies are setting the foundations to build the attack class submarine here in Australia? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, thank Order. you for the question. And let me be very clear. The attack class submarine is on time and it is on budget, Senator Stirl. In the current preliminary Order. design phase, we are starting to select many of the systems and also the future suppliers. As Naval Group Australia approaches industry, it is a mandatory requirement for Australian industry plans to be developed as they approach the Australian market. This will ensure that we are maximising Australian industry content, a minimum of 60 per cent. To ensure we are developing our knowledge base, our sovereign knowledge base, we already have over 100 Australians working in Cherbourg in France, which includes 20 of Naval Group Australia's 200 employees. As this project ramps up, I am absolutely confident Naval Group Australia will succeed in ensuring its presence in Australia generates thousands of multi-generational jobs and, in time, more defence export Order. exports. Senator Reynolds. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Cybersecurity and the Arts, Senator Reynolds. On Monday, the Minister said in relation to mail speed standards, and I quote, there have been no changes, no changes, no changes, no changes. I refer to the media release issued by the Minister for Finance and the Minister for Communications, Cybersecurity and the Arts on 21 April 2020, which said the following. Required delivery time for regular interstate letters will be extended to five days after the day of posting. Who was right, the minister or the media release? The Minister representing the Minister for Communication, Cyber Safety and the Arts, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I stand by my statement in this chamber earlier. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Ah, so you were right Means no changes, no changes, no changes. Hmm. Last night, Senator Hanson said of Australia Post workers. Order. Senator O'Neill. Senator O'Neill, please Thank continue. You. Last night, Senator Hanson said of Australia Post workers, and I quote, there will be no redundancy offered to these workers. 
Can the minister guarantee there will be no reduction in Australia Post's workforce? Senator Reynolds. Uh, as, as I said previously, as I believe I said previously in this chamber, there will be no forced redundancies of their posties, and that remains correct. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. It's been reported that Australia Post has hired James Hardy's former spin doctor. Why does the government need expensive PR advice when it's clearly capable of running misleading arguments without assistance? Order, Senator Reynolds. Senator Reynolds. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And I would remind the senator that Australia Post's day-to-day -day operations are the responsibility of its board and management, and not of government. Correct. Senator Cormann. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on a notice paper, and I also seek leave to um, uh, add to an answer provided uh, to a question uh, by Senator Watt uh, yesterday. Uh, leave is granted. I, I thank the Senate. Mr. President, I've written uh, to you in relation to uh, an answer I gave to a question by Senator Watt yesterday in relation to uh, bushfire relief. Uh, I stated that about $1.4 billion worth of bushfire response and recovery funding is already hitting the ground in communities. To clarify my answer, most of this $1.4 billion in funding comes from our $2 billion uh, national bush fire recovery fund, around $1 billion of it in fact, as I've previously stated. This of course includes funding that represents our share of the debris cleanup, which will be reimbursed to the state government in accordance with standard arrangements. The cleanup is uh, well underway, as I also outlined yesterday. However, as the Prime Minister always said, the $2 billion fund was in addition to the response and recovery funding that the Commonwealth already funds under standard disaster recovery arrangements, around $400 million of the $1.4 billion I referenced uh, as already hitting the ground as part of those standard disaster recovery arrangements of the Commonwealth funds. The fact remains that we have over $1.4 billion in federal funding uh, in responding to the bushfire crisis, hitting the ground in affected communities, and this is assisting those communities now. I hope that that clarifies the answer provided yesterday, and I title the letter. Thank you, Minister. Are there any motions to take note of answers? You wish to. Uh, Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I do thank Minister Cormann for providing yeah. that statement yeah. to Sorry, the Senate. Sorry, Senator Watt. Um, I thought you were doing taking notes. So I've, I'm a bit uh, so late no, to I catch seek, up. So you seek leave. I move leave. to take note or seek, 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 seek leave to take note of the minister's statement. Is leave granted? Oh. Is leave granted? I need an answer. Uh, leave is granted for three minutes, Senator Watt. Okay, that's all I need. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. As I was saying, I do thank Minister Cormann for uh, the statement he just made there. Uh, but unfortunately, again, what we've seen in that statement from Minister Cormann are three hallmarks of this government uh, from him and from the Prime Minister. Uh, misrepresentations of uh, their, their previous statements, getting basic figures wrong and being loose with the truth. Now, just to remind people what this concerns, yesterday I asked Minister Cormann a number of questions about the pathetic efforts of this government in relation to bushfire recovery. Uh, and in answer to the questions that I asked, uh, the minister uh, claimed, uh, and I quote, about $1.4 billion worth of funding out of the $2 billion National Bushfire Recovery Fund is already hitting the ground in communities. Now, I wasn't surprised that the minister made that comment because this is one of the uh, misrepresentations that this government is consistently making in relation to bushfire recovery. Uh, the truth is uh, that the Prime Minister announced a $2 billion bushfire recovery fund in January this year. The government's own figures, which were tabled about a week or so ago, indicate that uh, only $529 million of that $2 billion fund has been spent. The government then uh, tries to include another $470 million or so 
um, that it will be spending in the future on things like debris removal and tries to say that it has therefore spent a billion dollars from the $2 billion fund, even though they've actually only spent $529 million on their own figures. And then, to be that little bit more cheeky, they throw in another $400 million uh, of grants and loans that have been made to, disaster, to bushfire victims, as occurs after every single disaster that this country faces. That extra $400 million has nothing whatsoever to do with the $2 billion bushfire recovery fund, which, as I say, on the government's own figures, has only, in, has only spent $529 million. So I was a little disappointed when I got Senator Cormann's letter today, uh, where he says uh, that what he said yesterday was that about $1.4 billion worth of bushfire response and recovery funding is already hitting the ground. If that, if that is what he had said yesterday, then there wouldn't have been a need for me to write to him. But the truth is, that isn't what he said yesterday. What he said yesterday, in the answer to the question that I asked, was that $1.4 billion worth of funding out of the $2 billion fund is being spent. That is simply not true, and I think it would have been preferable for him to be honest in his answer in the letter that he provided uh, to the Senate today and admit that he got it wrong. So very disappointing that we see this minister misrepresent his previous statements. It's yet another example of him and this government getting their figures wrong. Anyone remember the $60 billion JobKeeper bungle? I think I remember that one. This minister does have a problem with numbers. He didn't get them for Peter Dutton either, and again they're being loose with the truth. Thank you, Senator. What, Senator Wong? Seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Thank you. <clears throat> a leave is granted for two minutes. Well, well you know, I, I rise to follow Senator Watt's comments and just make this point. When you have the leader of the government in the Senate being loose with the truth in question time, being given the opportunity to come in here uh, and demonstrate the accountability that our democracy demands from ministers, to demonstrate as the leader the examples to his front benches, what do we get? We get more measly words, more tricky words, a bit loose with the truth, doesn't fess up to the fact that he got it wrong. We would have more regard for ministers on that side if they were actually prepared to come in here and say, I correct the record. That's what democ democracy requires. But even from Senator Cormann, who otherwise is generally somebody who does understand uh, this democratic principle, we get more words where he's saying, well, I didn't actually say that when we know he did. And in the same question time, we have, uh, we have Senator uh, Colbeck refusing to acknowledge what after tax means. We have Senator Reynolds saying that a change from three to five days isn't a change. This is a mockery. And what it demonstrates is the rot at the top of the Morrison government, where the Prime Minister is loose with the truth. You're all being infected by it. And you bring it into question time, which is a travesty of what it should be in our democracy. And Senator Cormann, you should be ashamed of yourselves, and you should have fronted up. Thank you, Senator Wong. So we move to taking note. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Thank you, Madam Senator Gallagher. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Payne to the questions asked from uh, Senators Pratt and Billick. Uh, the questions asked of the Minister for Women, Senator Payne, today were going to issues around uh, women and particularly the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on women uh, and some of the particular issues that are being uh, drawn, I think, to all of our attention. Many of us knew these but, uh, previously, uh, but I think the coronavirus pandemic has really shone a torch not only on the value of women's work, but also some of the disadvantages uh, that women experience in the labour market. We know that women have lower participation rates, lower earnings. Um, we know that they've lost more jobs. I think in, May, in April alone, 500,000 um, people lost their jobs. 55 per cent of them were women. Uh, we know that more women um, feature in the underemployment figures. Um, and we know that in terms of lost hours of work, women experienced a greater, uh, a greater drop in hours of work lost. We also know that women are uh, overrepresented or disproportionately represented in industries that have been smashed by the coronavirus uh, restrictions, so in industries of food, retail, entertainment, accommodation. We know that women are overrepresented in, in uh, insecure work, um, in in work that uh, pays lower incomes, and all of this, um, all of those areas have been hit hard by the coronavirus uh, restrictions. 
On the other side, we, on the value of women's work, uh, Madam Deputy President, women are and have featured prominently in the essential frontline workers, nurses, healthcare workers, early childhood educators, teachers, um, aged care workers. 87 per cent of nurses and midwives are women. 87 per cent of aged care workers are women. 96 per cent of early childhood educators are women. And we have relied on these roles um, uh, to keep um, the community cared for uh, in terms of retail, in supermarkets and cleaners, again, where you will see more women than men. Um, key jobs that perhaps have uh, not been recognised for their value have been really shown to be so important uh, during the coronavirus pandemic. Now, the Minister for Women told us that the PM, that the Prime Minister and the government acknowledged um, the disproportionate impact uh, that the coronavirus uh, pandemic had had on women and the restrictions, the consequential uh, restrictions that were put in place, had on women. Well, I mean that admission from the government begs the next question. Well, if that's the case, why are they making decisions that they are making, which have again a harsher impact on women? And I'll come back to that. I think one of the issues uh, um, certainly is um, how they have designed um, some of the programs. If you take JobKeeper, for example, uh, designed to exclude um, people that might have one or more jobs, working cas highly casualised industries with high turnover, that will exclude uh, women from being able to access uh, JobKeeper. We know that women are doing more of the caring and unpaid work at home, taking on the, on the added responsibilities of caring for children and perhaps elderly parents. Um, again, that has come to hit women hard as well. So JobKeeper, I think um, Home Builder is another one where the government has ignored Treasury advice around social housing and the benefits of that. We know 62 per cent of tenants in social and public housing are women. Uh, we know they require um, social housing. Some women, and more, 62 uh, per cent require uh, social housing to uh, to support them, and again, this government, in their response on the housing front, have ignored that very important area, uh, which not only would bring uh, benefits, I think, from uh, public, it would be broader benefits uh, to the community as well. And childcare. I mean, why was uh, the childcare the first industry that was kicked off JobKeeper, with the snapback that's coming, with the fiscal cliff that's coming in September? Why was it childcare? I mean, if we're trying to get women back to work, why is it childcare? We know childcare remains one of the biggest barriers for women's full participation in the labour force, and yet this government chose to remove free childcare and kick the workers off JobKeeper and put in place a transition arrangement, which the minister acknowledges is less than what they were getting before. It's going to disproportionately affect women. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Selger. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President. I'm very pleased to uh, join the debate in terms of uh, the Labor Party's uh, question time tactics. And indeed, I want to focus on uh, Senator Pratt's question um, because I think, as we reflect uh, on the current state of play, as we reflect on uh, last year's federal election, and we think about how out of touch the Labor Party are, as was demonstrated again uh, by the Australian people overwhelmingly rejecting them. Uh, we think about the kind of issues and attacks that the Labor Party launches uh, on the government, uh, which demonstrate how out of touch they are. Now, Senator Pratt's questioning uh, attacking uh, Minister Michael Suker, an outstanding minister uh, in this government, doing an outstanding job. Uh, of course, we are reminded uh, of, of just how out of touch Labor are when their attack on Minister Suker uh, and a program uh, that is designed to support tens of thousands of jobs in the construction industry. Uh, the attack on Minister Suker is, uh, well, there's a lot of men who work in construction. Uh, that appears to be Labor's attack when it comes to the construction industry. Uh, so if you want an example of why they continue to sit on the opposition benches. Uh, perhaps we could reflect on their disdain for the housing industry, their inability to look beyond the very, very important issues 
the very, very important issues in the housing industry, because their critique now about the Home Builder program, so important to so many Australians, so important is, oh well, a lot of men work in the construction industry. And we'll come back. We'll come back to some of those issues. Uh, but I'm reminded uh, about, and I, I'd like Order. to compare and contrast, you know, between Minister Suker and uh, the coalition government uh, in terms of being in touch with their electorate and in the community. I'm reminded that Bill Shorten actually launched his campaign, I think, uh, in the 2019 campaign in the seat of Deakin, uh, in Minister Suker's electorate, because uh, they were coming to get him. They were coming to get him because they had a plan which the people in the outer suburbs of Melbourne were just going to embrace. Uh, they were going to make so many gains in Victoria. Why were they going to make those gains? Oh, it was because it was because the Labor Party had a plan that reflected the values of Australians. Now, now let's think. Order. Let's think about what some of those plans were. Order. Let's Senator think about McAllister. what some of those plans were. Well, central, central to their election prospects, which of course the people overwhelmingly rejected, was Labor's housing tax. Labor's housing tax. So here they are in question time again today, attacking a scheme, attacking a scheme that defends jobs in the in the construction industry simply because there are Order. too many men in the construction industry. Order. Well, what did Labor want to do to the construction industry? They wanted to gut the construction industry. One of the reasons that they were rejected at the last election was because of Labor's housing tax. Can you imagine and just reflect for a moment? Just reflect for a moment on where we would be if the Labor Party had, had come to government and implemented that housing tax ahead of the COVID crisis and the hit to the economy we have had. They would have had the absolute double whammy of being whacked from pillar to post. You know, the Labor Party talk a big game, and just before I go on to that, you know, I'm reminded as to, uh, as to how seriously they are taken on some of these issues by Tim Richardson, who says he's concerned about federal Labor's intervention because they haven't one, they've won one election in the last 25 years. Well, maybe it's because of policies like the housing tax. But they talk a big game uh, on women. But when it comes to actually acting, well, we've had the record in terms of women's workforce participation. We have delivered in a way that the Labor Party couldn't. Over 800,000, almost 900,000 jobs were created for women Senator by the coalition. But I'm reminded of what the Labor Party voted against in their protection racket for the CFMEU and the misogynist thugs in the CFMEU. And they say, oh, well, now we're acting on John Setka. In 2015, they rejected a motion. They voted against a motion that simply condemned Luke Collier for abusing in female FWBC inspectors. Um, Sean Reardon, who made threatening late-night phone calls to a female staff member of the building industry watchdog, to a, a CFMEU official, spat at a female inspector when she was called out to the worksite to inspect a union blockade. They talk a big game. We've seen it in Victoria this week. As soon as you go beneath the underbelly, as soon as you go beneath, beneath the veneer, we see what they actually do. And they're on the record here, defending the CFMEU, excusing their disgraceful behaviour. We're not going to be lectured to by this mob on the other side. Thank you, Senator Seselja. Senator McAllister. Thanks, uh, Deputy President. Well, for 2,509 days, this backward-looking government, as exemplified by the last contribution, has completely failed women. And while we live in hope that they might stop phoning it in from the 1950s, there's no indication that anything has changed during the most serious uh, period we've been through economically, the first recession in 29 years while we've been dealing with COVID-19. They have failed mothers by snapping back to a childcare system that is expensive and complex. They have failed older women, leaving them to face poverty and homelessness in retirement. They have failed young women in insecure and low-paying jobs by making so many of them ineligible for JobKeeper. We know what those opposite think about working women in their hearts. They think that women's economic lives don't matter and that they would be better served in the home, as we heard from Senator Rennick just this week. But unlike so many of those opposite, we don't hanker for a world where women are locked at home behind white picket fences. And unlike Senator Seselja, we don't think that women and men's interests stand in opposition to one another. We think that both ought to be considered and that this is an, absolutely, an absolute imperative in the public policy debate. Because Labor wants something more for Australian women. 
We want our daughters and our nieces to have every opportunity. We want them paid what they're worth on the day that they enter the workforce and every day subsequently. We want them to retire in dignity. If they decide to have children, we want them supported to combine a career with their parenting responsibilities. Now, is any of this, any of this at all, laid out in any way in the government's plan for women or for the response to COVID-19? We wouldn't know very much because the government rarely talks about women. And indeed, invited to do so today, we just had five minutes from Senator Zazelja where he could barely find, the, uh, find it in himself to even mention the word. They show almost no interest in the economic lives of women. It's not surprising in some ways that their policy settings have so little to offer Australian women when we think about the government's expenditure review committee, which is comprised entirely of men, not a single woman sitting in that most important decision-making body. And I recall on one occasion when I raised the issue of the unfair impact of tax arrangements on Australian women, then Treasurer Morrison responded with the patronising reply that we don't have pink forms and blue forms at tax time and there was no need to consider the impact of their tax proposals on Australian women. Well, the Liberal men of EIC may think that women's economic lives are a joke. Well, I can tell you that that is not how we see our lives. And survey after survey indicates that women want so much more. Tragically, the first thing they want is respect. Respect in the workplace, and I dare say they'd like some respect from their representatives here in Canberra. The COVID-19 period would have been a good opportunity for the Liberals to change direction, to come to grips with the very great differences between men and women's economic lives and the need for a policy that responds to the lives of women. The ABS has released data showing women have lost jobs since March at 1.3 times the rate that men have lost jobs. But we don't see any specific response to that or any indication that it matters. Part-time work and casual employment can be conveniently flexible, but often the result is that women are really taking these jobs so they can balance the work and family lives. Well, when it came to designing a response in COVID-19, what did the government do? They constructed JobKeeper in such a way that so many people in casual work were excluded, and so many of them were women. There is an opportunity now to create something better. We don't want a snapback. We don't want a snapback to an unfair world for women. We don't want a snapback to a world where women earn 14 per cent less than men. We don't want a snapback to a world where women retire with 47 per cent of the super balances of men. We don't want a snapback to a world where women's career possibilities are constrained because childcare is not available or affordable. We don't want a snapback to one of the most gendered labour markets in the world. This crisis presents a perfect opportunity to actually build something better for Australian women, and it's a shame the government appears entirely uninterested. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Your time has expired. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, this is an extraordinary straw man that the Labor Party continues to put forward. And I guess we should be used to it. We should be used to it at this point. Senator O'Neill, we should be used to it at this point, but in the face of an unprecedented economic and health crisis, in the face of an unprecedented economic and health crisis, where we've seen from this government a comprehensive response across the economy, across the economy, instead what we get from the Labor Party is the usual politics of identity, mm. politics of division. They cherry pick some information. They spin it in a particular way. They choose their data set very carefully. They ignore the overall economy. They ignore the comprehensive measures that this government has put in place to underpin our economy, to underpin economic growth, to get the economy moving again, to get all Australians back in work, to get all Australians back into the, into the in participation in the workforce, to get small business back up and running, to protect our families, to 
give people a chance to be the best they can possibly be. And we get this politics of identity, this cherry picking of information. So from the latest ABS stats, and absolutely I will acknowledge that the ABS stats shows that uh, the, the women in the workforce were impacted very, very hard by the crisis that confronts this government. But does the Labor Party, does the Labor Party Senator O'Neill ever raise the fact that the latest ABS stats also show that jobs for women recovered at 1.4 per cent, whereas jobs for men only recovered at 0.4 per cent? Do you ever talk about the identity politics of that? Of course you don't, because it doesn't fit into your narrative. It doesn't fit into your narrative. It doesn't fit Order. into this politics Order. of identity that you are seeking to continually drive. Now, uh, Senator Zelja rightly pointed out that almost 900,000 jobs created for women by this government in the uh, six years before the coronavirus uh, impacted our economy so remarkably and, and so with, with, with such great venom. Um, you know, this government has a strong and proud record of supporting women's participation in the labour market. Uh, prior to COVID-19, the March 2020 labour force figures showed record high, near record high uh, employment of women in the economy. Uh, six, almost 6.2 million women employed in the Australian economy. Labour participation rate for women uh, at a, a almost record high of 61.3% two and a half percentage points higher than when the coalition took office in September 2013. Between September 2013 and prior to COVID-19 impacting our economy, almost 900,000 jobs created for women. Wow. Do, does the Labor Party ever quote these sort of statistics? Of course they don't, because they're too busy Absolutely. playing the politics of identity, the politics of division, cherry-picking information, to suit their particular narrative. The Labor, Labor, Labor Force survey figures showed that seasonally adjusted employment for women fell by 325,000. And of course, this is the impact of the COVID crisis. This is an impact across the economy and one that this government is only too well aware of and one that this government is seeking to compre comprehensively address. Mm -hmm. Now, let me just give you one more example. Uh, today, uh, Minister Birmingham talked about uh, the need to open our borders to get the tourism and hospitality sector up and running again. That will disproportionately impact, in the positive, women, because women are a greater percentage of the workforce in that particular sector. Does that factor into Labor's narrative? Do they come out in support of Minister Birmingham jumping up and down and congratulating him for his words? at the press club? Of course they do not, because, again, it doesn't fit into their narrow world view. We want to get the whole Australian economy. We want to support all Australian workers. We want to support all Australian working families to get um, out of this economic and health crisis, to get the economy back up and running again as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator O'Neill. Well, thank you uh, very much, Deputy President. And uh, what a shock! What a shock that we've got all blokes on that side speaking on this issue, where we've been asking for them to verify the fact that they have failed women during this massive, massive crisis facing Australia. COVID-19 is an experience that many of us have could not have imagined and will never ever experience it. And the burden Order. of care that has fallen to women Order. has fallen heavily on the women of this nation. I am proud to be an Australian woman. I am proud to be an Australian woman in the Labor Party. There are many of us. We are very varied and very different, and we bring our perspectives to this place. We bring them in many, many more numbers than you guys. Now, I will give you the fact that on this side of the chamber, you've got a few more here in the Senate, but you couldn't line one up today, not one, to stand up to answer our questions about women being affected uh, by COVID. You left Senator it to the blokes again, Senator, your usual standard. Senator O'Neill, uh, there's a point of order, I think, from Senator Smith. Point of order on quotas. Uh, that's not a point of order, Senator Smith. Uh, Senator Smith, please resume your seat. That is not 
a point of order. Please continue, Senator we, We've heard this bleating and moaning from these poor men opposite oh. who are denying even what the minister said right. in the other place. The women have been hardest hit through COVID-19, um, and that is Senator quoting their— Senator O'Neill, please resume your seat. Senator Just for those Smith. people who are not able to watch on television, one is, third Senator, of the Labor senators Senator are men Smith, on the other are side. you raising a point of order? If you're not, please refrain from interrupting. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. I can tell I've hit a raw nerve because Senator Smith is actually one of the more exemplary senators on the other side, and I can see I've even upset him. So I consider that quite, quite effective in arguing the point that this government— uh, Senator O'Neill, please resume your seat. Is it a point of order, Senator Smith? I was just going to comment on Senator O'Neill's accurate re reflection uh, on me. Senator Sorry. Smith, that is not a point of order. I think senators have the right to be heard in silence and people jumping up, making spurious points of order, fit into the category of not um, being respectful to the senator making their contribution. Please continue, Senator O'Neill. Uh, look, I've heard of mansplaining, but I think we've got man interrupting here going on. A woman speaking her mind, Australian Labor woman speaking to the reality of Australian women who are at this very time making decisions in one critical by-election in the seat of Eden Monero. They've got a choice between sending another bloke like this lot to come to Canberra or sending a great woman in the shape of Christy McBain, and I encourage them to do that. Because the problem with this government is they simply do not listen to the voice of women. They do not understand the challenges of being women in Australia. And if they're going to call being women in Australia and standing up for women identity politics, then they need to go back and learn a few issues, a few understandings about what identity politics actually is. Minister Lee, in the other, in the other place, Order. declared the fact that women have been hardest hit through COVID-19. And what I'm worried about as a, an Australian woman standing up for the women impacted is that this government has lined up a set of policies where we are set to snap back to unaffordable childcare right around this country. Women are talking to me. They're talking to their partners, sitting at dining room tables, figuring out how much they can actually manage in terms of putting food on the table or paying for childcare, because this government has so mismanaged the whole childcare sector. They are dudding aged care workers, not providing them with the promised money that they announced. We see this time and time again, a series of announcements from this government and then failure to deliver. They're taking away from childcare workers. They are refusing paid parental leave. These are the priorities of this government. And when they said at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, in response to great passionate advocacy by the unions of this country, the big businesses of this country and the Labor Party, when we begged and pleaded with this government to provide wage subsidies, they finally came through with a job seeker. Yep, they came through with it, but who did they take it away from first? They took it away from the women of Australia. They took it away from the childcare workers, the most female-dominated industry in this country. Women in Australia need to remember that this government does not stand up for you. The Liberal National Party government have failed Australians. It's a matter of international record from the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report that Australia was 23rd in the rankings in 2013, 23rd in the world in terms of women's, uh, women's uh, economic capacity. The reality now, after seven years of this blokey dominated LNP government that's out of touch with the women of Australia, is we've slipped all the way down to 44 of 153 countries. And after what they've done, in response to COVID, I have no expectation that it will rise. In fact, I'm sure it will get even worse. We know that this government has failed Australian women. We are very concerned as the Labor Party that childcare will not be accessible to women, that they won't be able to get back to work, that there will be barriers to their participation in the economy and the society. We are concerned that Scott Morrison's snap back will actually be a job crusher for the women of Australia. Question is the motion moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. 
Thank you. And just to uh, let the chamber know, I'll be using half of our allocated time, and Senator Faruqi will be using the other half. I rise to take note of the answer from the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin, to my question on Job Seeker, and the answer is yes. The government still is intending to drop to drop. Job seeker back to the old base rate of $40 a day. And when I asked, have they done any projections or modelling on the expected mortgage defaults? The answer obviously is no, because she filibustered that question and did not adequately answer it. So no, they haven't. Now, anybody watching what's going on in this country will know that it is not going to happen that the 1.64 million and that was the last time we got an answer at the covid uh, select committee on the number of people that are unemployed in this country and receiving job seeker who thinks they're all going to be employed by the end of september when job seeker ends who thinks that i bet you no one thinks that all those people are going to be getting uh, jobs by that time as much as we wish it was so realistically it's not going to happen and the government needs to be planning for that but are they what are they going to do with, for all those people? So, are they planning for the fact there's going to be a massive number of people that will have to default on their mortgage payments, that will have to default on their rent? So, where do they intend all these people to live? For a start, we are going to be escalating our homelessness. For a start, and when I asked, okay, what advice are you going to be providing to Australians in terms of which bills they don't pay? Because you cannot meet all your bills when you are living in poverty on $40 a day. Which bills? Energy, food. Food is usually the first to go because it's discretionary. So we're going to drop people back into poverty on $40 a day. And what impact is that going to have on our economy and our recovery? That it will have a very significant impact on a devastating impact on our recovery. And it will also impact on the states, because the states will also be losing out on those people's income who are spending and injecting money into the state economies. It will also be the states that are expected to supply the community services, the emergency relief, the homelessness shelters when people start having to default on their payments. It isn't good enough. You need to keep the rate. Question is the motion moved by Senator C would be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to take note of the government's woeful response to my questions about the total lack of concern for, for the welfare of animals in the live export trade and the failure to establish an independent office of animal welfare. The live export industry has been plagued by scandals for decades, and people right across Australia have had enough. They wanted to stop. The scathing 2018 Moss Review into regulation of the live export industry exposed that the Department of Agriculture lacks the skills, resources, technology, culture and will be, that will be effective in regulating the industry. The department cannot possibly promote the live export industry and its profitability and at the same time protect animals. We know that as long as the Department of Agriculture is allowed to regulate the live export industry, animals will continue to suffer, they will continue to die on these ships of misery. It should not be left up to whistleblowers and grassroots animal advocates to uncover the industry's crimes and hold exporters to account. The only way to begin to fix our broken animal protection system is to establish a truly independent authority with responsibility for animal welfare. Since they were elected in 2013, the Liberal National Government has done nothing to improve animal welfare. Worse, instead of holding abusive industries to account, they grant exemptions for animal cruelty. It is pathetic for this government to claim to be shocked and appalled whenever the routine abuse of animals is exposed, to cry your crocodile tears and then return to business as usual when you think the scandal has passed. By the time this retwa ship, carrying tens of thousands of sheep, reaches its destination, thousands of sheep would have suffered inevitable heat stress. Do your job for once, ban live exports and establish an independent office of animal welfare. Question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary no, the ayes have it.